Well, welcome. Welcome to you all in the name of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Today we come, we worship God. It's the day that we are reminded not only of his birth because of the season, but the fact that he lived, he died on a cross, shed his blood so that we now can gather, that we now can have an interest in him. This is the day that our Lord was risen from amongst the dead and we as his people rejoice. Let us hear God's word uh, to bring us into his presence from Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that they might still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visiteth him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with the glory and honour. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth, through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Amen. What is man? What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visiteth him? Let's pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with those words ringing in our ears. Lord, if we were to answer the question, what is man? Lord, so often we would elevate ourselves. We would talk about our accomplishments, our our goodness, our worthiness. And yet when we're faced with the scriptures, when we're faced with the triune God of the scriptures, when we're faced with our own sin, our own mortality, our own rebellion against the living God, whose name is excellent, who has created all things. In the light of that, we can understand why the psalmist said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Father, we pray that as we enter into our time of corporate worship this day, Lord, that we may meet with you, that your spirit would come and speak to our very beings, our souls, that we may know what it is to worship almighty God. Lord, we pray that our worship would be acceptable before you because we come in and through our Lord Jesus Christ the eternal Son of God, in flesh, incarnate, Emmanuel. We come into your presence through that shed blood of Calvary. We have no other plea. We have nothing that we could present to you, Lord, for our worth when it is considered in accordance with your word is non-existent. And yet the great fact is that you do consider us. You have poured out your love upon this fallen and rebellious world. And you have drawn so many men, women and children into fellowship with you. Father, we pray for our loved ones that do not know you as yet. And we ask, Lord, that in your mercy, 
in your hesed, Lord, that you would draw them to you, that they too may fall in love with Jesus Christ. Lord, we think of those not with us today. We especially think of Richard and we pray for your healing hand upon him. That your shalom, your peace may be known in his household. Now, Lord, accept our prayers. Accept our worship. Meet with us this day, we ask in Jesus name. Amen. For the last time this year, and they go away after today as well, um, let us turn to the carol sheets. Number 10, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Number 10. Notices God willing, we meet on Thursday for our fourth sessions of the Doctrines of Grace in John. Uh, the topic on that day will be part one of Sovereign Election. Just to read the message introduction, the doctrine of so sovereign election, when viewed in an improper perspective, may seem cold and unfeeling, depicting God as callous and arbitrary. Arbitrary in his election of some and not others. Yet this viewpoint fails in two significant ways. First, it assumes that man deserves God's favour. Secondly, it does not recognise the extreme love demonstrated by God toward his son and his elect. Election finds its root in God's love. And Dr Lawson will explain in this lesson, far from being a dictatorial, meaningless activity by an unfeeling God, sovereign election expresses the fullness of God's love for a sinful Unrepentant people unable to make the choice to love God for themselves. We've had some good discussions, we've had some disagreements and we pray that the Lord would meet with us on Thursday as we think upon the scriptural truth of election. And what does it mean for us as sinners? What does it mean for us as those who trust in Christ? Eight o'clock, all welcome. Next Lord's Day, we prepare our hearts and our minds to meet with God's people, to worship God and to share in communion the Lord's table. I ask that you would search yourself over these few days before, the week before us, that you would seek the Lord and that you would come to the Lord, not as a casual thing, but as something that has real worth to your soul that we may truly commune with God that we may be raised in Christ to meet him in the heavenlies pray for one another pray for our own witness our own walk as disciples of Jesus and we meet for the Lord's Supper the preaching of the word and worship uh, next Lord's Day at 11 o'clock before we turn to the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, I'm going to ask John if you would pray for our gathering and the hearing of God's precious word to us today, that we might have ears and a heart to hear. Our Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that it might please you that this small gathering here might worship you in spirit and in truth. I pray, O Lord, that you would give us the mind and the heart and the desire to learn from your word. <coughs> we know, Lord, that you could lead a water, uh, horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So I pray, O Lord, that that true desire to drink from your word would be upon each one of us here. I pray, O Lord, that you would teach in power this morning, that those areas of our lives, O Lord, that need dealing with, that, O oh Lord, you would convict our own hearts, and that, Lord, you would give us the strength and the ability to overcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would be with Robert this morning, and that, Lord, you would give him utterance, <coughs> that his words will be 
as it were, directed by your Spirit and direct from you. Teach us, I pray, from your Holy Word, the Word that you have prescribed, O Lord, that we should Lord, understand and know who you are. So I pray, O Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us again in more depth this morning, to the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name, Amen. Amen. Let us join together and sing number 12, O come all ye faithful, number 12. If you'd like to turn into the word of God to Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, and our reading shall be from verse 36 to the end of the chapter, and that can be found on page 1011 of the Black Pew Bibles or page 63 of the New Testament in the large brown pew Bibles. We continue our reading from last um, time we met at Christmas Day, from Luke 2, verse 36. And there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asa. She was of a great age and had lived with an husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about fourscore and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she, coming in that instant, gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all the things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintances. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. This is God's word to us this day. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we ask that you would now meet us in your word, through your word, that you would instruct our minds, that our hearts may be opened to, to glory in who you are, to glory in our Saviour, and to grant us hope for the future. Lord, teach us, we pray, in the name of Jesus Christ, by your Spirit. Amen. So we come to the fifth section of, of our Christmas um, sermons, as it were. Our first one was the sign of the virgin birth. The second was the miracle of the virgin birth. The third was the wonder of the virgin birth. Christmas Day, we had a divisive Christmas. And today, I want us to look at a subject, a, a doctrinal teaching of the scriptures, I want us to look at the humanity, the humanity of Jesus. Did you notice as we sang, God of God, light of light, 
Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. I think most of us here, if not all of us here, have very little problem with the divinity of Jesus Christ. And yet, although we claim that we truly believe that in this man, Jesus Christ, is God, fully, truly God, he is also fully and truly human. And yet I think we have so often the tendency to either downplay one nature of what theologians call the hypostatic union, the joining of these two natures into one person of Jesus Christ. You will have to forgive me today. Um, Previously we've been talking topically and today it's going to be slightly different. We're talking doctrinally. So I pray that we all may learn. So we come to our last of our Christmas series of five messages. The first three majored upon the virgin birth of Christ. And we touched upon so many doctrines and scriptures looking at the prophetic nature of God's sign to show his creation, his choice, his sign of Messiah, of his anointed one. We thought about what who this baby in the manger was, God in the flesh and the wonder of this. And our Christmas Day service reminded us that this Christ who came into this world was a figure and is a figure that causes many to be humbled in this life so that they may be raised to the next. And there are those who are proud and will not humble themselves to God and his requirements and how they finally will find that Jesus Christ is the stumbling block and one that will crush them. A divisive Christmas. Jesus divides. He divides the saved from the unsaved. He divides his seed, his inheritance from the inheritance of Satan. And he is a divisive figure if he is truly understood. Today I want us to think about some of the implications, not of Christ's divinity, which we have majored in upon over those uh, sermons, but his true humanity. What does that mean for us? We all acknowledge, we, I believe we all acknowledge the fact of the hypostatic union. A nice long word just means the two, the joining or, or, or the coming together of the divine and human nature in the one person of Christ. And we often stress, understandably, Jesus' divinity. When we come across people like Jehovah Witnesses, uh, Muslims uh, and other people, we have to uh, come forward and say, no, you've got the person of Jesus Christ wrong Yes, he was man, but he was also divine. He was the eternal, co-equal God, the triune God of the scriptures. And although we do not exhaustively understand the nature of the incarnation, how these two can be brought together, we nevertheless acknowledge it as the clear teaching of scripture. We've also touched upon the fact and the importance of Jesus' humanity, the need for him to be a real human being in order for our salvation. God doesn't bleed, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins. We we thought briefly over uh, that area. Yeah, I think the church understandably finds that these two natures in the one person of Christ difficult to comprehend, And therefore often against the scripture and against the creeds tend to emphasise one nature over the other. And I think we do it inherently. And I often hear this this jarring statement 
And I've heard it many times, even in this place, where you see some miraculous, something extraordinary regarding Jesus' obedience to God. And then you hear this term, well, he is divine after all. He is God. And what we mean by that is, that means it doesn't affect me. I can't do it, and I'm not even going to try. And that terminology I hear so often, and I find it so very worrying. Because Jesus Christ is truly man, as well as being divine. For some, it is the divinity of Christ that is of highest importance. And for others, it is humanity. Just go along the commentary shelves in, in, a, in a Christian bookshop and you will find humanists writing on Christian theology. The divin uh, uh, divineness of humankind. How God, in the person of Christ, uh, I can't say the word, divin no, makes us divine. That... Somehow, in the per incarnation, God makes us divine. We see this often, deification, that's the word. We often see this in um, Greek Orthodox understanding. We often hear of uh, us being glorified, as we have it in ours, and they have deified in their translations. So, the importance of Christ. Being God is pushed to the forefront. And for others, it's his humanity. And both are in danger of devoiding the Christ of the scriptures from his unique and important role of being the one mediator between man and God. For he is the man, Christ Jesus. And on the other hand, they are at risk of deifying humanity and putting the creation on par with its creation, or creator. Christ is indeed very God, a very God. And at the si same time, he is very man. These two natures need to be held in unity. That, might, they, that may defy our total understanding. Yet, it is a tightrope that needs to be navigated carefully. In order not to fall into the chasm of heresy that's on either side. The two jumping platforms that confront us today and where we start are to be found in our reading of Luke chapter 2. Namely verses 40 and 52. Luke 2, 40. And the child, this is Jesus, grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. In this verse, Luke summarises Jesus' entire childhood by compressing the first 12 years of his life into this single verse. We want to know more about what it was like for Jesus growing up in a sinful world when he is the God-man. And yet scriptures are silent. We have the apocryphal gospels, which are fanciful, and not scriptural, and from that, uh, the Quran takes its teaching upon Jesus falsely. But the scriptures remain relatively silent about his those years between his birth and, and the twelfth year, uh, his visit to the temple. There is a similar summary at the end of this chapter where Luke describes his life from adolescence to adulthood. Luke 5, sorry, 2, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. These verses testify to the physical, intellectual, spiritual and rational development of the Son of God. It does the same to my mind as well, John. Quoting Philip Riken in his Reformed Expository Commentary, and this is a long quote, but I couldn't say it any better. His physical development is the easiest for us to understand. 
We know that when God the Son became a man, he took on a human body. The baby in the manger was a real baby, with all the physical needs that any baby has. As an infant, Jesus woke up in the middle of the night hungry. He needed to be nursed, burped and changed. We also know that when Jesus was an adult, he suffered all of the limitations of our physical existence. He grew tired and hungry. He needed to eat and sleep. His temptation to turn stones into bread was a real temptation, faced when he was on the verge of starvation. And most importantly of all, it was a real body that Jesus offered upon the cross for our sins. It was flesh like ours that was torn and bloodied by the nails. This was the only way that he could save us. For as the Bible declares, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. That we may die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. 1 Peter 2.24 But what happened to the body of Christ between the manger and the cross? Luke tells us that he grew and became strong. Jesus went through all of the ordinary stages of physical development. He had to crawl like a baby before he could walk like a man. First he was a newborn. Six months later he could sit up. Then he learned to use his hands and his feet to move around. Somewhere around age one, the son of God became a toddler as he learned how to walk. Then he turned into a little boy and almost before his parents knew it, Jesus was a teenager. So Jesus grew from infancy through adolescence to adulthood. When we read that Jesus increased in stature, we can almost imagine his parents keeping his growth chart on the wall of their family home in Nazareth. This is part of what we mean when we say that God the Son became a man. Jesus came to save us in the body and to do this he took on all the difficulties of our physical existence. <clears throat> How often do we think in those terms? We talk about the reality, the truthfulness of, of the humanity of Christ. But we don't think that he actually needed to grow, to develop. As a true human. But this is not all that we mean. We also mean that Jesus was growing intellectually. The great historic doctrine of the church is that the son of God became a real man. Not just someone who only appeared to be a man. This is something that the Roman Catholic um, Theologians have great difficulty with. Although they give credence to the creeds, they often find it difficult to, to take the passages where Jesus speaks and says, I don't know. When will you return, Lord? I don't know. Only the Father knows. And they find it so difficult because they elevate the divinity of Christ above his humanity. The reformers drew both of these, not in tension, but together and kept within the bounds of scripture. And so when we read of things like that, we, we don't believe that Jesus, as the person of God, the eternal son of God, didn't know. He's omniscient. He didn't give that up. There is no kenosis in that sense. He didn't give up his attributes. He didn't empty himself of his divinity because then he couldn't be our saviour as we thought of several weeks ago. But equally, as a man, it's appropriate that, that he speaks this way. For he had to grow, to learn, to read God's word, to study, to rely upon the spirit of God. And this was what it means for Christ to be truly human. He didn't just appear to be human. He didn't have, as it were, 
a physical body, a human soul and the mind of God. It wasn't the, the logos, the eternal word that indwelt the mind. He had a mind as well. It's what it means to be human. When he was born, God the Son placed the exercise of all of his powerfulness and his all presence and all knowingness under the direction of God the Father. He did not give up those attributes, but he submitted, so Riken says, their existence in his life to the Father's discretion. Though he was sinless, he had a real human body, mind and emotions, complete with all the inherent weaknesses. This is the doctrine of the incarnation. So often we stress the divinity of Christ at the expense of his humanity. We need to hold these things together. The Son of God became a man. That the divine person of the Son assumed a human nature. Understand what this doctrine teaches Jesus had a human mind as well as a human body. Many Christians think that they believe in the incarnation when what they actually believe in is that Jesus had the mind of God in the body of a man. There's an ancient heresy called Apollinarianism. And that's what he taught. That's what was condemned at the Council of Nicaea. And yet I think we so naturally tend to fall into that direction. And by that, we are denying the true humanity of Christ. What the Bible actually teaches is a full incarnation, in which the divine nature and the human nature are joined in the one person of Jesus Christ. And because these two natures are united in the one person, both divine and human attributes are properly connected to the person of Jesus Christ. His humanity was a full humanity, including reason, will and emotions. How could we say that God became a man unless he had a human mind as well as a human body? Like his body, the mind of Christ had to develop. We often don't think that way. That's where the Gnostic Gospels and the false Gospels come from. They attribute to him miracles because it's, it's just a little God growing up. He's not truly just, he's not truly human. He, he is God in the flesh. And they mix and they fail. But all we need to do is look at the scripture which says that Jesus increased in wisdom. Do we believe it? Here Luke expressly tells us that the intellectual, moral and spiritual growth of Jesus as a child was just as real as his physical growth. He was completely subject to the ordinary laws, as we would think it, of physical and intellectual development. As he submitted to the very laws that he had created. Jesus was taught things that he did not know. Can you imagine the first time that Joseph perhaps handed him a chisel? Hopefully he had a better luck than me. He was perfect, so I know that he went to the cross perfectly without deformity. But he had to learn. He had to grow. He understands who we are. Donald McLeod explains that he had a human mind subject to the same laws of perception, memory, logic and development as our own. He observed and learned and remembered and applied. This would have been impossible if he had been born in possession of a complete body of wisdom and knowledge. In his humanity, he was born with mental equipment of a normal child. 
experienced the usual stimuli and went through the ordinary processes of intellectual development. He had an advantage, don't get me wrong. He was sinless. The noetic effects, the, the, the effects of sin were not upon his mind. He could understand the word as he grew to be able to read, as he grew to be able to hear and understand. And yet he was truly human. Some say that Christ was born with a sinful nature, which I find abhorrent. And they used the reasoning, well, if he didn't have a sinful nature, then he wasn't just like us. But that devoids all of the future, all of the promises of God to dwell with him. Where there is no sin, it takes that all away. To be truly human is not necessarily to be sinful. When Adam and Eve were created, were they created sinful? No. Sin entered the world. But to be truly human, and this encourages me for the future, does not necessita necessitate sin being part of our existence. Here we are confronted with the starting reality of the incarnation. What the, many of us would overlook and not even think about the true implications of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the eternal Logos, the Word of God that we met in our opening of John's Gospel last week. He grows. He truly learns. And he truly increases. But what does this mean for us? It means that we have a role model. One that we can look towards and pursue after. As true man, Christ is the perfect man. He is what we ought to aspire to. I'm not saying that we'll attain it. But it gives us that opportunity to pursue after him. To follow after him. We can't just say, well, he was divine. And fall into laziness. We need to be following all that he has taught. All that he has shown. It's the Great Commission. To me, these are rem remarkable verses. We expect Jesus to know everything perfectly. After all, he is God. Yet we do not ponder upon what it means that Jesus was truly man as well. He grew. Physically, I suppose it can't be helped, can it? You bring a baby into this world and by the age of, God willing, if they reach it, 10, 11, they're not a small baby anymore. It just happens. It occurs. Or does it? Things need to happen. They need to be fed. They need to be cared for. They need nourishment. So what is the role of growing spiritually? In one sense, if you have been born of God, then spiritual growth is also an automatic response. And yet... Although we're readily available to help our physical growth in eating and drinking, in resting, we don't seem so enamoured by the thought of our spiritual growth. We'll eat, we'll drink, we'll rest. We'll set times in our diaries to do it. Or as soon as we feel hungry, we'll go and eat. We're in a privileged position in this world. But what about our spiritual growth? How do you think Jesus grew in his knowledge of God as a human, a true human? Let us look briefly upon how this growth was realised in the human life of our Saviour. First of all, the company that he kept. 
He had godly parents, verses 39 and 41. And when they, that's the parents of Jesus, had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they were considerate. They knew God's law. They taught God's law. They obeyed God's law. Verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. They did that which was required of them. He had godly role models. We can also think back of their characters as represented and shown throughout the Gospels. Matthew 1, Luke 1, and all the way through the Gospels we see their piety, their, their love, their misunderstanding on occasions, but always that intent. Jesus was surrounded by godly characters. He attended to God's word, verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him where? In the temple. Sitting in the midst of the teachers or the doctors. Notice what it says. Both hearing them. He didn't go there just to instruct as we would often think, well, you know, we have the wise child Jesus here telling all of the Pharisees and the Sadducees what really was going on. He went there to learn, hearing them, asking them questions. Why would you ask a question unless you didn't know the answer? He attended to God's word. In the hearing of it and in the questioning of the meaning of that word. He also obeyed that word. Verse 51. Now I hope I don't upset Rob here. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. He obeyed his parents. He was subject to them. He was sinless. The company that he kept. His attention to God's word. And his obedience to that word as well. And we also know many times where we see Jesus in the Gospels taking himself away to pray. He relied on that communion, that intimate communion of prayer with his heavenly father. He didn't just go off uh, for a quick nap because after all he is God. In his humanity he spent hours, days in prayer. We can't just push that to one side and say there's no call upon our life. From the example of Christ. In any of these things. But we also see something within the Gospels. Of Jesus' reliance upon the Holy Spirit. We may know doctrine. We may pray. We may read God's word. We may try and obey but without the reliance of God's Holy Spirit in our life what good for what end for what purpose as a human Jesus relied upon the Holy Spirit and we can often mitigate this and downplay it with that same saying well Jesus was God after all but he is our true example. For Jesus to be reliant upon God's word, to pray, to walk in ways that are pleasing to his heavenly father, he relied upon the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, third person of the Holy Trinity. 
He didn't just take his prerogative of being God in the flesh and live off that. Nor should we as the children of God just take that glorious privilege and live off that. Day by day we need to trust, seek and look for God's activity in our life through and by his Holy Spirit. We can't just say, well Jesus was God after all. For with a sleight of hand and a few magic words we give ourselves the excuse not even to try to follow our master. Well, Jesus was God after all, wasn't he? Yes. But don't downplay his humanity and the example and the pattern that are set for his disciples. For Christian, this is not acceptable. Jesus was not only sent here to save us from our sins, but also sent to show us how humanity ought to live. What it means to be pleasing to our Heavenly Father. And how his disciples ought, therefore, to live. He is our example of what we ought to be. Each one of us that name the name of Christ. He is the one that we look to. Not a preacher, not a celebrity, but to Jesus our king, our master, our sovereign. So if you're not reliant upon the word, if you're not reliant upon prayer, if you're not reliant upon the Holy Spirit, then you are living in disobedience. We are living in disobedience if this is true of us. If the company that you keep is dishonouring to God and is not helpful in your spiritual growth, repent and turn to the Lord for more of his spirit, more of his ear and a greater understanding of his word. For to grow you must follow the master and that means work, nourishment. I'm not saying to abandon your ungodly friends I'm not saying that you need to disown your acquaintances, not at all. But I am saying that if you prefer their company, their advice, above and over the company of the saints and of God's word, then there is something very wrong with either this church or with you. Where is it that we seek counsel from? I know me. My default position is, <laughs> it's, it's like, who wants to be a millionaire? I, I call out for a lifeline, but it's always, nearly always, never to the right person. Rather than going direct to God, I often will ask Charlotte or, or friends or other Christians, what do you think? Rather than seeking God straight away. There's something wrong with my thinking, with my life, when I do it that way. To grow, we need to hear God's word, to be in communion with him in prayer, and we ought to be growing in our faith daily. How many of you would go without a day, without eating or drinking? And yet how many of you are content to leave the scriptures on the table or on a bookshelf for days, perhaps even a week before you turn to it and then you wonder why everything seems to be growing dim, that you're shriveling up in your walk and your faith. We need to rely upon his spirit to lead, to guide us in everything that we undertake. Even the mundane things of life, God is interested in all of them. Even Jesus did this. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience 
by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And although it is true that each of us so often fall and fail, our God and Master, our true example, who is Christ Jesus, this ought not be a place where we hang our heads down in shame and wallowing in self-pity. For the fact of the humanity of Christ also brings to us a wonderful comfort as well. For in Christ we have a God and a Saviour that can and has and does come alongside us. Because we learn that even Jesus grew in knowledge and learning, we can take comfort. God does not expect us to be fully formed Christians as soon as we're saved. Any more than he expects the child at birth to come out as an adult. He knows our frame, that we are but dust, that we are human. And he knows that not from afar off, but because he is coming to our environment, has lived amongst us. The comfort of the incarnation is that God not only knows this but he also understands this for he has occupied our space and our existence he isn't the false god of islam who is distant uncaring unapproachable unknowable he is the true god who welcomes his children to him because he knows, he cares, and he understands. Hebrews 2, 14 to 18. For as much then as children are partakers of the flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetimes subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels. But he took on him the seed of Abram. Wherefore in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren. That he might be merciful and Faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself have suffered. Being tempted he is able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 4.15 For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. But was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. The incarnation brings great comfort to failing Christians because we have a God who understands, who feels, who knows what it is to be human. One can characterise Jesus' entire life with the words, it behoved him. In all things to be made like unto his brethren. This likeness is repeatedly emphasised. Since then the children are sharers in the flesh and blood. He also himself in like manner partook of the same. He was made in the likeness of man. He was even tempted. He suffered in those temptations. Well he was God after all. Surely he didn't suffer. In his humanity he suffered. God cannot suffer. Impassibility of God, another long word for you. He doesn't experience change. He's eternally the I am, the unchanging one. But in his humanity 
He suffered. He was tempted. He knows what it is. He can sympathise with our infirmity as one that hath been in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. There's the great difference. It's not his humanity. It's the sin that so often blocks our eyes from the truth of God. That rebellion that still exists in each saved Christian. That old man that wars against the spirit. His sinlessness and holiness, according to scripture, does not detract one iota from his true humanity. His humanity comes to the surface, especially in the bitterness of his sufferings. Think of those intense emotions at the Garden of Gethsemane. Was it just a pantomime? When Christ calls out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Was he lying? You lose the humanity of Jesus Christ. And these verses will become incomprehensible to you. If Jesus needed strengthening in the Garden of Gethsemane to bear the burden that was about to uh, come upon him, then why should we be ashamed that we also need strengthening from one another as uh, gifts from God? And ultimately, not only from angels that we might often encounter, as the scripture puts it, unaware. But more directly from God himself as he dwells in his people by his Holy Spirit. There's a great comfort knowing that God understands us because he has literally stood with us. But in the incarnation there is another great truth and comfort. That man and God can live together in peace. The incarnation is the route for us to enter into that. But the fact that the divine and the human come together in one person. Is the greatest Shout to the universe that man and God can dwell together in peace. Some would want to distance the availability of God and humanity. They live in a dualistic world where the enemy is physicality and matter. Think of the monks that, that drew away from, from everyday life. Because it was somehow sinful. Matter is sinful. How often do we have that same thought? Oh well that's my secular life. It's not important to God. That duality. The scripture nowhere condones this type of thinking. And the person of Christ proves it. In one sense, there is no secular uh, and sacred divide to your lives. In one sense. Your whole life needs to be lived out for Christ. Wherever that life takes you. God has made us in his image. Therefore, there is possibility of connection and fellowship sin is the disruptor of this and christ in the flesh has destroyed it christ is now approached is there is now the only approach to god through his cross his blood he has made a way for god and man to live side by side the incarnation proves it for in this one person dwelt God and man harmoniously. 
1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the spirit. 1 Timothy 2.5, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Colossians 1.20.21, 20, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him. I say whether they, those things be in earth or in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore being justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the experience of the glory of God. Do you see the comfort of the doctrine of the humanity of Christ? We must always guard ourselves against elevating his humanity, against his divinity, or the other way round, uh, elevating his divinity over his humanity. He is one person. He is the undivided Christ. And in the past there have been many heresies that have come about that have been rejected then only to resurface in a slightly different form. And most heresies revolve around the nature of God and specifically the person of Christ. The reason that we get so upset about this is because in his humanity, Christ reconciled us to God. And in his divinity, Christ secured once and for all that man and God can once again enjoy unbroken fellowship. Both are needed. And neither can be marginalised. To do so is to rob our saviour of his salvation for man. It is to deny the scriptures and to deny the very Christ that we claim to believe in. This is why it's so important that we see the true humanity of Christ joined with his divinity. This is why we are not to elevate one nature against the other. In short, the reason that it is so important to acknowledge and to believe in the two natures in the one person of Christ is to avoid heresy and to also to avoid our own laziness. I've got a whole section on heresy here and I'm not going to go through it. I don't think you'll be edified by it. We've spoken about Apollinarianism and we're also going to talk very briefly about Docetism. It comes from a Greek word which means to seem. Seems like. And what they believed is that God appeared to be human but he wasn't there was no flesh and blood involved they were so intent on securing his divinity that they did away with his humanity and I think that's what we do when we might say as an excuse well God Jesus was God after all in that statement, we are downplaying his humanity and we have no right. We, we, we aren't docetic, but that's where the tendency lays when we use that terminology. And we also need to avoid our own laziness. Because in that term, what we're really saying is, I believe Jesus was man and God. But when anything difficult comes up, when everything, anything that, that appears in the scripture that seems too difficult for me as a mere human to achieve, then I can ignore it. I'm not saying that Peter could die on the cross for us and save us from our sin. That's not what I'm saying. There are things that are appropriate only to the divinity of Christ. But there are things that we walk and we talk and we move in. 
scripture, prayer, reliance on the Holy Spirit. It's not good enough saying, well, Jesus was God, wasn't he? For we are in danger of excusing our own walk when we read of Jesus fasting and praying to God. Rather than see this as the humanity of Christ, we ascribe it to his divinity. When we read of his temptations and his overcoming those temptations, rather than seeing the true man resisting those temptations, praying and relying on God's spirit to enable him to face those temptations and to overcome them. Rather, when we see obeying God's word and relying on the Holy Spirit as our example, we merely brush it off and see his divinity at work. Reducing the reality of what Christ suffered in this world on our own behalf. The scripture and the person of Jesus Christ does not allow for this. We have to take serious the reality of his humanity for our growth and for our obedience. To do any other is to reject the Christ of scripture, to reject the Christ of our salvation. So to finish our look, a brief look at the humanity of Christ today, we are to see in the person of the unique God-man, the gospel. Our hope of God who is approachable and knowable. A God that comes alongside us to encourage and strengthen us on our difficult pilgrimage. A God who can and does empathise with our trials, our temptations and suffering. And a God who brings peace to mankind, to all those who will follow the Master. So I ask, will you follow the example set before you or you just brush him off and say it's not for me Jesus's humanity does not allow for this let's pray our gracious Lord and heavenly father we we're truly amazed that, Lord, in one sense, the incomprehensible nature of the incarnation, and on the other sense, a God that is so close that we could, we feel as if we can even touch Him. Lord, I pray that You would strengthen us, and that Your Holy Spirit would come to us and. Enable us, like Mary, to ponder on the things that we have heard today and the implications for our lives. Father, we ask that you would strengthen us by your spirit, that we would no longer wallow in our own laziness, we would not wallow in the fact that we are sinners, although this is true. But we might place our eyes upon the Saviour, the man Christ Jesus and follow after him. Father, we thank you that you know our frame. We thank you, Lord, that you know that each one of us will fail, will sin, will fall short. But we thank you that in the person of Christ we have assurance of our own salvation. The assurance that you have made a way possible. And you've actually achieved a way for your people to dwell in unity with you. Father, we've thought much about the divinity of Christ over these past weeks. But Lord, let us also wonder and glory over his true humanity also. We thank you. That you are a God who is approachable. A God who understands. And a God who has not given up on humanity. 
Lord, lead us out of this place as your people. Lead us out of this place that we might talk, gossip, evangelise, Lord, the great glory of the person of Christ. Let us never be ashamed. Let us never be put to confusion. But enable us, Lord, for we ask it for the glory of Christ and the upbuilding of his church, the body of Christ. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Ghost, be with you all. Amen.